Genesis chapter 8. We're not playing around now with the Word of God. And let me just kind of um, I'll give you the, the, the run, the string run from Genesis 1 to Genesis 8. I'll hit all the notes. And, and you, follow, you follow God's pattern. God always has patterns. Always. There's patterns in the sky. Those stars are not randomly set there and move around in random positions every night. We've known for thousands of years where to expect Venus, where to expect Alpha Centauri, where to expect the Big Dipper, where to expect all these constellations. We have it down. Navigators used to travel by the stars at night. They used the North Star as their guide. And so all the stars are in order. And if you go out and look at trees, it may seem like there's a disorder to the branches and to the leaves, but they're not. There's an order. There's a unique order to all of that. And that's God. Everything has a cycle to it. Everything has an order to it. Everything that God made, you can identify that God did it. He's the artist that leaves his signature on everything that he does. So if you follow the number patterns, okay, let's start with Genesis We'll start with the number meanings in the Genesis chapter. The number one is the number for beginnings. And lo and behold, that's where the Bible begins. It's where the universe begins and time begins. And everything that God did starts in Genesis 1. That's the creation week. Then you follow, you follow the course. The number two is the number for division. Here you have Adam. He's one man. God divided him in half, made two out of him. The two became one. You have the number three, which represents the Godhead, but it also represents... The lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. That's what you see in Genesis 3. So you see the first sins coming into the world and the seed. Think about it this way. Sin was seeded into this earth, was it not? Sin was seeded. The devil used seed out of his mouth to get man into sin. And that seed is still here. It abides in this flesh. Still there. That's why the flesh is corrupt. That's why it's going to die. The number four is for the gospel of uh, the spiritual world. You have the two sons, Cain, who is of that wicked one. He represents Satan. Abel, whose blood speaks righteousness. God accepted his sacrifice. He is slain. And uh, God put a mark, of course, on, on, on uh, Cain. And his lineage dies off in the flood. There are no descendants of Cain anywhere on the earth. The number five deals with death, but then the rapture. We have Enoch going into heaven. The number six is the number for preparation. And Noah's preparing for what's coming. But it also represents the joining of opposites. Christ bearing that number, the number of man and the number of God. You see it in the lineage of Matthew chapter 1. There's 42 names in that lineage, 14 plus 14 plus 14. That's six times seven, six for the number of man, seven for God. And Christ was fully man and fully God. Okay. And it's the joining of the two. And what do you see in Genesis six? You see the sort of the devil's version of that, the opposite, the sons of God and the daughters of men joining together to create an abominable race on this earth, the giants. And I believe in that. I believe in giants. Amen. And they were big and mean and cruel. They could do things that nobody else could do. And it was sort of the, the corruption of the seed in Genesis 6. That leads up then to God's final judgment in Genesis 7. Seven's the number for completion. God ends it. It's over with. It's done. Um... I think, if I remember right from my notes, there were like seven unique things that Jesus said from the cross. Last, of course, would be what? What's the last thing he said? It is, forget, it is finished. It's over with. It's done. He, he represents the finished work of man's redemption. Nothing to be added to it. Nothing taken away. Somebody say amen. So in Genesis 7, God ends the world. It's the end, 7 represents the end of the world. We are about ready, don't know when, what year, but we've had the bypass now of six days. A day with the Lord is as a thousand years, a thousand years is one day. I have this in my notes tonight. So we've, 
run almost to the end of the sixth day. We can expect darkness to fall. And the thing that hath been is the thing that shall be. There is no new thing under the sun. Once again, the heavenly seed mingling with the seed of men, just like Genesis 6, taking place near the end of the sixth day, 6,000 years from creation. Okay? And I don't care what the geologists say. I don't care what all the astronomers say. Don't give me this 13 billion years nonsense. It doesn't work. It's not real. It doesn't exist. Believe your Bible. It's, it, means, it says exactly the way God wanted you to understand it. 6,000 years. So then the Sabbath is coming. This, where God's going to finish the work of man and all of its evil. He's going to give the earth rest for a thousand years. That's what Genesis 7 signifies. What is God cleansing the earth with in Genesis 7? Water. And what is water, what is one of the things water would represent? Cleansing. It's a, they call water the universal solvent. Okay, it dissolves things, it scours, it cleanses. So water is the type of the word of God, cleansing the earth. Jesus is the word of God. So he's pouring out, think of the vials of wrath, and there's seven vials of wrath poured out. So God poured, literally pours this wrath out on the earth in Genesis 7, and it's over with. All flesh has died, all man has died, all the animals have died, all the birds have died, all the dinosaurs are dead, everything's dead, and they're laid out in very unique patterns in the earth, in the way that they died, and my question is, they, they find all these fossils all over the earth. My dad brought some home. He had, a, he had a flower garden in front of our house, and he had some plates of rock there, and they had all had, the, every one of them had little fossils in them, every single one of them. And I, this, I used to go out and just stare at them. That fascinated me. How did all of these fossils show up when, in fact, when something dies in nature, immediately nature starts decomposing all of that to where there's nothing left of it, including the bones. Bones are eaten by animals. They're eaten by scavengers. Okay? Everything gets dissolved. By the, by, uh, it's said that Mother Nature keeps a clean house. So everything's dissolved. How did these fossils form? How did they? How did these? We have perfect imprints of dinosaur skin in stone. We know what their skin looked like because we have perfect imprints of it in some cases there are fragments of dinosaur dna left okay how did that happen the only way is if for when these animals died they were immediately pressed into the minerals that are in the soil completely mineralized by the pressure of the water okay so that the, all the minerals, calcium, lime, whatever it is, that it just completely takes over what that animal was, converts it almost immediately into stone because of the pressure of the water down on it. And then as the water went away, the imprint is still there. The bones are still there, embedded in stone. And we know this is possible. We know it doesn't take millions of years for layers to be laid down. Just go to Mount St. Helens. And in literally weeks, all these layers put down and they've solidified. So we know it doesn't take that long. So now we're at Genesis 7 is done. God's going to start all over again with Genesis 8. And 8 is the number for new beginnings. A new world. A new start. Isn't that what God gave each one of us? A new beginning, new start. So Genesis 8, verse 1. God remembered Noah, which would have been easy. He's the only guy left, him and his three sons. That's it. So it's not hard to remember him. God remembered Noah and every living thing and all the cattle that was with him in the ark. God made a wind to pass over the earth and the waters assuaged. The wind having power over the waters. Who has power over the wind? God does. The fountains also of the deep and the windows of heaven were stopped. And the rain from heaven was restrained. Who restrained it? God did. He's got the power. And the waters returned from off the earth, 
continually. In other words, God pulled the plug on the drain. Now all the waters are going down. Okay? And the waters, verse 3, the waters returned off from off the earth continually. And after the end of the 150 days, the waters were abated. And the ark rested in the seventh month on the 17th day of the month upon the mountains of Ararat. And the waters decreased continually until the 10th month. So after 150 days, at the end of 150 days, the water stops going up. So day 151, water stops going, starts going back down. Day 170, day 190, day 200, after the flood. The waters, all of a sudden, the tops of the mountains start to appear again. And the ark is over the area of Ararat. And so as the water goes down, the ark then gently rests on solid terra firma but the water's still going down it's not time to release the animals yet it's not safe the world isn't ready for that so uh, verse 5 and the waters decreased continually until the 10th month and in the 10th month on the first day of the month were the tops of the mountains seen so we have five months the water's going up five more months now you can start seeing the tops of the mountains okay uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer, ask him to bless us. Uh, my mind's racing today, so it ought to be fun. Uh, pray for Brother Sterling. He's going to be having uh, surgery Tuesday. They found a few more cancer spots in his bladder. They're going to go in and remove those. And uh, so just pray for him. He's our good man. Amen. And I uh, appreciate all the men in our church and love you and, and want to keep you around for a long time. Okay. So anyway, let's pray for all of these. Heavenly Father, we thank you, dear God, for your word. Thank you, Lord, that you just give us simple faith. And Father, we can probably go out and learn all the things that the geologists have studied and all the things astronomers think they know, and we can probably learn all that. But Father, it won't change what I believe. I believe you created this earth six days ago, 6,000 years ago. I believe, Father, every word of the Bible. I'm looking forward, Father, to believing and hoping in what you said about the future. That's what I cling to. That's why we strive to live what we live. And, Father, some days it is, it's hard, it's difficult. Some days are not easy. But, Father, the joy that is set before us we know people, Lord, that we have loved that are in that place now. We want to go there. We know it's in your time. We know it's in your hand. But, Father, it'll make the things that we go through in this life worth it. Father, we pray, dear God, for all those in our church that need help from you. Bless them. Heal them. Bless doctors. Bless medicines. Bless nurses. Bless the patients. Father, just bless our people. And Father, we have some, Lord, that are really struggling. And Father, my heart goes out to them. I love them and I pray, dear God, that you'd help them. Help each and every one. The devil's hitting them hard and I, I think I understand why. You've done great things with this church. Things, Father, we cannot even comprehend the difference that we've made in people's lives. And because of that, Father, things are not going to go easy for us. But that's okay. Because without our enemies, we'd be probably too arrogant to live for you and do right. So Father, we thank you for our enemies. We thank you, Lord, for the chores we have and the struggles we have. It makes life real for us. It keeps us sober, keeps us right with you and on our knees. Father, give us relief. Give us grace, Father, and give us help. Bless your people and bless your word tonight. Give us hope for a new day. We pray in Jesus' name and all of God's people said... Amen. So think about the pattern God sets, establishes every week. In fact, every day. Every day the sun rises, that's a picture of resurrection. Christ was res resurrected from the dead early in the morning. As the, Think of the sun rising up as resurrection time. Um, but then at the end of the day, the sun goes back down. It starts getting dark again. We have that pattern. We fall asleep. That's a picture of death. Sleep the sleep of death. Next day, we're resurrected again. And that happens every day. And then you think of the pattern of a week. 
Uh, by the way, 24 hours in a day is 24 divisible by the number 8. Sure it is. Okay, 8 times 3 is 24. So 8 in 24 represents a new day, a new start. Seven days in a week. Sabbath is the rest. Sunday is the first day of the next week, but it's the eighth day. It's a new start. God starts the pattern all over again. Whatever happened last week is gone. You can't do anything about it. Can't change it. It's all, it's all over with. If you did bad, repent, move on. If you did good, tell God thank you and move on. Forget about it. Move on. God, don't look. Woe be to the man. Puts his hand to the plow and looks back. Why? Why is that? We'll look back and say, look at what I've done. Look at what I accomplished. Don't do that. Look ahead at what's still left. We got a lot of work to do. Amen? So that's the, that's the order that God, and of course, you have eight days, that represents new life and new beginnings. How many people? How many, turn to 1 Peter chapter 3. How many people's on that ark? Eight. Four men, four women. But that was fun. Can you imagine those four women telling Noah, Hey, hey, are you, are you lost? Do you know where we're going? Why don't you ask for help? Am I making that stuff up? Huh? You what, Melissa? You don't think they did that? Yeah. I'm being comical. First Peter chapter 3. Think of the water, what it represents. Uh, sometime he's talking about the angels, which sometime were disobedient when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah. There's that phrase, days of Noah. While the ark was preparing, that was in Genesis 6. That's the number 6 was for preparation. Wherein few, that is, eight souls were saved by water. God had that number set and wants us to understand what that number represents. It represents a new start. Out of eight people, God seated in fact 7.5 billion people in this world right this minute and they all came from three couples that's it so every race of man caucasoid negroid mongoloid three primary races three families that were on the ark that seated all of those races and everybody in the earth is either a pure concentration of that seed or a mixture of that seed but they're all people that God loves. Amen. Don't ever forget that. All the other religions put people in categories. Hinduism is bad about it. To me, Hinduism is one of the worst religions in the world for putting people in categories. Usually it's the darker color skin. They put them on a poverty level and tell them you're down here because in your past life, you were a pig, you were no good. And so you got to suffer through this life. And maybe, maybe if you're good enough, you might become lighter skin like I am and, and in the next life rise to a higher level. I hate that. makes me angry. Amen. Pointed unto this man, unto man wants to die and after this the judgment. Not keep on living lives and trying to do better. But anyway, while the ark was appearing where in eight, few that is eight souls were saved by water. The like figure wherein to even baptism doth also now save us. And don't, and I had somebody ask me a question about this. Does water baptism save us? No. The only baptism that saves you is being washed by the Spirit of God. Baptism of the Holy Ghost. That's it. It alone can wash you clean on the inside and make you pure. Make your conscience clean. You know you sinned, but now you know you're forgiven of those sins. Okay? So, and he says it, not the putting away the filth of the flesh. It's not the baptistry or the river, especially the River Jordan. River Jordan, one of the muddiest, looks like the Mississippi. Looks like Joachim Creek over here. Muddy, filthy. Okay, but that's what they're baptized in. So it's not the washing of the flesh that saves you. It is the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So you got saved and all of a sudden God put a new man in you. Keith Crum, I'll never forget it, that old boy, he got saved there. Five minutes before he learned he's going to die of cancer, he gets saved. And then he tells his sons three days later, he said, I don't know what it is, I just feel like i got somebody living inside of me. And I laughed at Brady and Bradley, I said, you boys have been reading the Bible all your life. 
And it took you years to understand that. Your old daddy found it out in two days. He got somebody living inside of him. So I'd say he's got it. Amen. So anyway, that's what happened. That man knew he was right with God. He knew he was saved. He knew his sins were forgiven. I'll never forget that day as long as I live. By the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So the, think of the water representing the baptism, represents the Holy Ghost, represents the Word of God. God is purifying the earth, scouring it, cleansing it. So he's not going to flood the earth again to do that. What is he going to do to purify the earth the second time? Fire. Fire is a purifier. The, I said that kind of mixed up. Fire purifies things. You understand that? Second Peter chapter 3, turn there, a couple pages over. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 5. Listen to your Bible now. For this they're willingly ignorant of. And I would say that every geologist, every climatologist, Every anthropologist, people that study the origins of man, every one of those clowns are wrong. Every one of them. Because they are willingly, they've heard the flood stories. They know that every civilization throughout history told a flood story. Every one of them. They probably got them in Korea. Korean mythology probably is full of a flood story, is it not? Sounds right. I didn't even, I didn't even know it. Okay. Who was Noah? Do you know in Korean mythology, I'm sure there was one character that was saved w when the gods or whatever flooded the earth. Do you know who it was? Okay. All right. Well, that's cool. The Gilgamesh epic was written as one of the earliest writings on the earth, and it told a flood story. The Native Americans all had a flood story. The First Nations up in Canada had flood story. The Aztecs, the Mayans, the Incas, the Peruvians. They all had flood stories. The Greeks, Romans, Chinese, Japanese, dirty knees. They all had flood stories. Okay? Every one of them. So, geologists then willingly ignorant of this. They will not regard it. They will not fathom it. The, that by the word of God, listen to this phrase, by the word of God, the heavens were of old. And the earth standing out of the water, so the earth, meaning the dry land, stood at the day of creation, stood out of the water. But then, what does it say after that? In the water. Whereby the world that then was, being overflowed with water, perished. He's referring to the flood of Genesis 7. Now look at verse 7. But the heavens and the earth, which are now... By the same word are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. That's how God's going to do it the last time. It's going to burn it all up. So it says, but beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing. He makes it very clear that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years. And a thousand years as one day. In the book of Psalms, David gave a double witness to that. A thousand years in thy sight, O Lord, are as but yesterday. So we have two witnesses in the Bible. One Old Testament, one New Testament. I like it that way. Because it testifies to you how God measures things. So think about, I've used this illustration before, but it makes sense. Think of what God told Adam. In the day ye eat thereof, then ye shall surely die. So, Adam ate, but he survived that night. Was God wrong? No. Nobody lived to be a thousand. Methuselah was pushing it. I'm going to make it. I'm going to make it if it's the last thing I do. It will be the last thing you do. 969 years. Clunk. He either died of old age or died in the flood. Because he died the same, you do the chronology, he died the same year the flood happened. 600 year of Noah's life. Do the math on it. You'll find Methuselah and, and probably Lamech died in the flood. What a shame that out of 
Noah's daddy, Noah's grandpa, only Noah. Well, yet think about it too. Had, La had Methuselah got on the ark, would he have survived the flood, gone on to be 970 years, 980 years, 990 years, a thousand? God said in the day. So you measure a day, how God measures that. In this case, it would be a thousand years. So think of the creation, think of the week. Sunday's first day, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, six days. God's got, God's got reserved a thousand years as a day for his millennial reign. That is the rest that he's going to put on the earth. And I look forward to that. No more burning buildings. No more, and I'm glad the President of the United States declares Antifa a terrorist organization. And not the church. Amen. We're not a threat to this government. We might be a threat to evil government. We're not a threat to this government. Amen. Amen. But Antifa is. And he so what that means is, he can use the full power of the government's monitoring programs. Where they got all the cell phones, all the text messages, all the emails, and all the location of all these Antifa people. As buildings catch on fire, they've got 12 people with Antifa and their cell phones in that building. When that building, they can, they can pin it down and know who was there. Get them! Amen. All right. But he's laying out, he says, verse 8, be not ignorant of this one thing. Don't forget that. So we just know. You know, that's why a lot of things were said about the year 2000. Is that going to be the year? Is that going to be the year? Is that... Well, God must have something else in mind here. Because here we are, 2020. Hasn't happened yet. So I got out of the business of trying to say, it'll be this year, or it'll be this year, or it'll be next year. I got out of that business. I'll let God deal with it. Amen? Now look at Isaiah chapter 60. I like this. Isaiah 66. Turn there. And we know that Isaiah... Is a picture of the Bible in, as a whole. The Bible has 66 books. Isaiah has 66 chapters. That's not an accident. And if you look at it, the New Testament starts in book 40 with Matthew. And if you look in Isaiah 40, it starts out with uh, the voice of him crying in the wilderness, prepare you the way of the Lord. And that's what Matthew starts out with. The voice of him crying in the wilderness, prepare you the way of the Lord. So... The divisions of the book of Isaiah match the layout of the Bible. So Isaiah 40 matches the beginning of the New Testament. Isaiah 66 matches the end of the world. Because then he says here in Isaiah 66, 22, he says, for as the new heavens and new earth, underline that in your Bible. That's the first pretty much dead on target. I'm saying it out loud, saying it word for word. First time really God says, I'm going to make a new heaven and a new earth. Isaiah 66, 22. For as the new heavens and the new earth, which I will make, shall remain before me, saith the Lord. Which means, not only is the creation of it ahead of us, but once God creates it, it will always remain and never be destroyed. Finally. New car smell forever. Wouldn't that be neat? And you'd never get used to it. You know, you get used to smells. And you're going, oh, it's a new car again. Forever. Uh, verse 23. Oh, by the way, he said, so shall your seed and your name remain. God's going to preserve people for this time. And it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another. Now stop right here. Is there going to be a moon in the new heavens and new earth? Yes. Okay. Now, it won't be used to measure darkness. There will be no darkness. Okay. But it will be seen. And apparently it will still have its cycle. Because he says from one new moon to another. We also know... That in the book of Revelation, he talks about the tree of life. And it bears 12 manner of fruits. One fruit for each month. And they're for the healing of the nations. 
So what we know is, we know then the moon is what designates a month. The lunar cycle gives us our month. Then we know that each month there's going to be 12, just like there are now. So we, we know these things are going to continue on, but they're, they're be different than how we're perceiving them now. Again, the moon will not rule over the darkness because there will be no darkness. Okay, but there will be a new moon and there'll be a new one after that. And then he said from one Sabbath to another. So now we have the continuation of weeks. One Sabbath to another. So shall all flesh come to worship before me, saith the Lord. And they shall go forth. Now here's, this is interesting. They shall go forth. And he's talking about the people in the new heaven and the new earth. We're going to have eternal bodies, no sin, no disease, no sickness, no sorrow, no pain. My back is killing me today. My legs hurt. My mom stayed home today because her back hurts. So anyway, that's all going to be gone. So, but they shall go forth, look upon the carcasses of the men of the transgress against me. Whoa. God says they're cast into the lake of fire. And according to this, we're going to see everybody in there. Continue reading. For their worms shall not die, neither shall their fire be quenched. Have you read that somewhere else before? Yes, Jesus quoted it when he was talking about hell. Where their worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. I think, here's my idea, their worm is their soul. Okay, I think that's their soul. Um, I don't want to get too much into that. Think of a caterpillar. What does it turn into? Butterfly. So what that's about is caterpillar is indicative of our soul. The chrysalis that it makes, little tomb that it makes, it makes its own tomb and casket and dies in there, literally. It hibernates, but then is transformed and is reborn with four wings, just like the angels in Ezekiel 1. I like that. Okay? I preached a message years ago called From Worms to Butterflies. And a lot of people liked it, and some people hated it. I'm not a worm. <laughs> okay, whatever. For their worms shall not die, neither shall the fire be. So what's going to happen is, according to, according to Revelation, God resurrects the damned, all of those who are in sin. And he gives them a new body that will bear everlasting punishment. And he says, look this phrase up, everlasting destruction. Now, when we picture something being destroyed, like the CVS that they burned down in the black neighborhood in Minneapolis, which was stupid... Because it took them years to get CVS to put a pharmacy there. And they finally did. And those hoods at Antifa burn it down. So that was destroyed. And we think of destruction as it's destroyed and it's no more. But with this new body that God's going to give them, it will bear everlasting destruction. You understand that? It's kind of hard to perceive. But it will bear everlasting like fire and it will consume them and continue to consume them how long does it take to consume an everlasting body eternity how long does it take to pay for sins forever so don't let any social media will kill your doctrine in a heartbeat don't let anybody talk you into this nonsense that once you die, that's it. You're destroyed. You have no, have no mind whatsoever. It's not just the Jehovah's Witness and the Mormons that are telling that. It's a lot of crackpots on Facebook and YouTube. Because now everybody's got a channel to portray their false idiotic doctrines. And people buy into it. I'm, a, I'm stunned. I'm amazed at the ridiculous nonsense that people fall into. And I mean, I, I'm not jealous but I marvel 
that some of the most idiotic doctrines get hundreds of thousands of views and likes. Okay, I'm, I just marvel at that. That tells me this world is not what I think it is. Amen? So, and they shall be an abhor abhorring to all flesh. So, we're going to see all of the bodies of all the people that are bearing the torment of everlasting fire. We're going to see them. Why? Well, I take it, and they shall be an abhorring in all flesh. I think that tells us we look upon them, and for eternity we say, praise you, Jesus, that we are not there where we deserve to be. Amen? That'll keep us, keep us right. Revelation 21. Well, I like this. Here it is. Revelation 21, verse 1. I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away. There was no more sea. Stop and think about that for a minute. What does fire do to something? Consumes it. With oxidization. Right? It oxidizes like the paper in this Bible. It'll rapidly oxidize it and consume it. What does rust do? Same thing. It's, it's a form, it's a slower form of oxidization. And it consumes what it's on. What starts rust? Minnesota people, tell me what rusts your car out. Salt. Salt. Okay. Uh, Pastor Cooley is I think he's I think he said he's buying a new car. From way down south. I said, why? He said, because you don't buy cars from up here that are used. They're all rusted out underneath. Am I right? Okay. What is the ocean full of? Salt. Look it up in the Bible. Salt is a burning. It's a type of burning. If you ever get into a salt water with a wound, do you know it? Ah! Feels like uh, iodine or mercurochrome. Oh my goodness, I hated that stuff. Burn, 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 burn. So the sea is like a type of burning. Okay? So God eliminates that from the new heaven and new earth. Does that make sense, everybody? There's no more sea. All the water now is clear. It's not corrupted with salt. Okay? And verse 2 I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he, shall dwell with, he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their first time in human history where now the God is going to reveal himself to mankind. Now we are able to look upon his face without dying. Amen. I don't think that we can fathom the glory of what we're going to see. I don't think we can fathom it. Closest I ever came to anything like that was I took the kids to downtown St. Louis several years ago. And they did fireworks under the arch. And, and you're standing up with the city behind you and all those buildings. And they're, they're reverbing all the explosions. And... To watch a grand finale on TV, you've not seen it. You don't know what it is. To be standing there on that hill above the Mississippi River with thousands of explosions of light and brilliance exploding right in front of your face, one after another, after another, after another, after another, hearing the reverb come off the buildings behind you, I caught myself laughing out loud with excitement and joy. And experience it. I can't describe to you the overwhelming feeling that rose up in me. I'm going, this, this is the coolest thing I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> it's no wonder people cheer and laugh because and, it does that. When we see God's face for the first time, that glory, we've never known it before. And we get to see that forever. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. 
The ark, remember, is Christ. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Now, I've been asked this question, too. What about people that I knew that when I get to heaven, I find out they're not there, and I see them burning? And I love them. Will that not cause grief in me seeing a loved one in the flames of fire burning? And I said to them, I don't believe that. I believe when God removes all tears from our eyes, He means that. We won't see them and feel for them the way we did down here. He literally is going to make all things new, including our emotions. Okay? Right now, we suffer sorrow and grief, mourning, pain, loss, all of the anger, sadness. We suffer all of these things. God is going to remove those from our being in heaven. We will not experience that like we experience it down here. It will be brand new and stay that way eternally. Isn't that great? Now, let me give you a, a picture of this. Turn to Jeremiah 36. I thought about this last night, this morning, something like that. This is about the uh, King Jehoiakim. And remember, how did God... We, we read this in Peter. It was by the word of God that the heavens and the earth of old were, and then it was in, out of the water and then in the water, and now the earth and the heavens are reserved again by the same word of God. How did God create everything? With his word. The blueprint of creation is the Bible. So look at what this king does with the Bible, with the blueprint of the universe. Verse 22. Now the king sat in the winter house in the ninth month, and there was a fire on the hearth burning before him. It came to pass that when Jehudi had read three or four leaves, he cut it with a pen knife and cast it in the fire that was on the hearth until the roll was consumed in the fire that was on the hearth. The roll represents the universe. The heavens and the earth created by the word of God. How many leaves? Three or four. Okay. And it was cast in the fire and consumed completely. Was anything left of it? No, it says, until all the roll was consumed in fire that was on the hearth. Yet they were not afraid, nor rent their garments, neither the king nor any of his servants that heard all these words. Nevertheless, El Nathan and Deliah and Gemariah had made intercession to the king that he would not burn the roll, but he would not hear them. So this roll, I believe, represents the heavens and the earth. It's cast into fire. But is God done? Jeremiah 36, 32. Look at that verse. Then took Jeremiah another roll and gave it to Barak, the scribe, the son of Neriah, who wrote therein from the mouth of Jeremiah all the words of the book, which Jehoiakim, king of Judah, had burned in the fire, and there were added besides unto them many like words. So now it's double the words that it used to be. And that is a picture of the new heavens and the new earth. God created the old heavens, the old earth, because of man's transgressions. They are burnt with fire, but God is not done. He's going to create a brand new one. And do we think that the new one is going to be better than the old one? I do. I In fact, that's why we are still here trying, striving, serving God. Because if we didn't hold to that, Josiah, what have we got to look forward to? Joe Biden? Huh? Um, I won't say what, but I may have an opportunity to interview somebody who worked in the White House and got sick of it and left. I'm getting hooked up with somebody. Maybe. Okay? So, maybe Tuesday what I'm hoping for. And I told the guy that's hooking me up, be sure and tell the guy whatever he tells me, I got a big mouth and a microphone and I'll say it. Like I told Al. I told Al, Al, what you tell me? I'm going to say it. So don't tell me nothing you don't want me to say because I'll say it. I can't hold it in. But anyway, that's what God's going to do. He's going to burn everything up. So everything we strive for down here, 
Everything we labor for, everything we do, what's, it, what's going to happen to it? It's going to be burned up. So that's why those who lay up their treasures here on the earth, you don't keep them. Jeffrey Epstein left $547 million was his net worth when he died. What does he have now? Nothing. Nothing but fire and punishment for his sins. Elvis Presley, what does he have now? Nothing. Janis Joplin, what does she have? Uh, Jimi Hendrix, Jimmy Morrison. Um, all these evil rock and roll singers, all these evil occultists. Aleister Crowley, what's he got? Nothing except hell fire for eternity. So it makes you think then, what would be better? To work and labor for things on this earth or to work and labor for things in heaven? Amen. Amen. And I got some more, but let's go to prayer. We'll talk about the dove and the raven next Sunday night. And every one of us has got a dove. Every one of us has got a raven. Right? What color are ravens? What color are doves? See it? There's a difference in them. Okay? What do ravens eat? Guts. Maggots. Roadkill. Ugh. What do doves eat? Seed. It's a picture. Okay? Everybody's got a raven. Everybody's got a dove. It depends on which one you feed. Which one's going to be in charge? Amen?